This is Stephen Sloan. The date is October 21st, 2011. I'm with Mr. William Dippo uh, at his home at 5546 Crosswind, San Antonio, Texas. Uh, this is an interview for the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission's Texas Liberators Project. Mr. Dippo, thank you for sitting down with me today and doing this interview. Now, I told you I wanted to go slow, so I would like for you to tell me a little bit about the Dippo family going back. So we're going to begin around your birth, but give me a little bit of the family background if you would. I'll start with date of birth. <laughs> the real date of birth. Okay, 15 June 1925. That was a good year for grapes. I was told later on. Um, uh, boy, we'll go from there. Hey, wait a minute. Uh, me, lost a word? Um, <laughs> I have two sisters, um, both junior to me. <clears throat> um, my my dad uh, was born in 1900s, and um, he wanted to go to World War. Why should be looking at you? He wanted to enlist in World War II, but uh, his mother, my grandmother, was a tough old Irish lady, Kilfoyle, and she. Boxed his ears a few times, and he realized he couldn't uh, enlist. So when my time came, my war came, uh, I had nobody to box my ears. I could do just about what I wanted, if I was not immoral or illegal. And I live by that credo, by the way. Um, <clears throat> so my dad was a shirt cutter. Um, Arrow well, shirts, as a matter of fact. I always had plenty of shirts. <laughs> I was the best dressed kid in school for shirt centers. I didn't, I didn't, my pants were baggy, but my shirts were very nice. They're silk and everything. We had a lot of gangsters around New York, upstate New York, and they liked custom shirts, so Dad sort of helped me out in that respect. Uh, mom was a was a mom, uh, home stay at home mom, and there's uh, uh, not much to say. She she had, uh, she had raised three children, and uh, oh, she did hit me with a coat hanger. I think I broke it when I told her I enlisted in the service, and um, oh, I'll tell you a funny story about her. Um, uh, so anyway, um, <clears throat> so the family, uh, I have my other one sister was born in 28, another born in 32 or something. Um, and then the family grew up and then the night, I left high school. I left just as I was supposed to go into to, uh, the fourth year. Uh, uh, I, I would probably, you could, I would say patriotism, but I didn't I probably even know the word then. Uh, yes, I did. Um, but I just wanted to get away for some reason. The police weren't after me. For, <laughs> no, I'm sure they weren't. And uh, so, uh, knowing that I couldn't get in at 17, I had a, oh, this is, I had a, a couple of guys that during the war there were coupons. You had to have sugar coupons, gasoline coupon, you know, coupon coupons. And I was aware, but never partook in the in their um, uh, job deal what they were doing. They were counterfeiting those. So who do I go to to fix my birth certificate? That's my two friends who subsequently we were in jail. Well, I was in Boston, not Boston, <laughs> Bastogne. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, I got in, 17. Um, I enlisted, so I asked for the cavalry. I was pretty good horse rider, as a matter of fact. I could jump, I could, uh, I could uh, curry his tail. I was used to that because of the National Guard. I used to go away with my dad, uh, who was in the National Guard right from 
after World War II, because, uh, one, because he couldn't go. So he became a National Guardsman and an officer within the National Guard set up. Uh, and I would go, when I was like 13, 12, 13, 14, I would go away to, to summer camp when they were called to active duty for, for two weeks. And uh, that's where I learned how to take care of a horse. Uh, and they weren't looking, I used to ride them bareback around in the corrals anyway. Anyway, I enlisted for the, for the cavalry. And, um, so why for the cavalry? Why did you enlist in the yeah, cavalry? Well, did, huh? Why in the cavalry? Why did you enlist in the because cavalry? Because I could ride a horse. Yeah. I didn't know any better. There was no cavalry. There was no cavalry, but I'm, I just said that. And, um, oh, I, 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 there's something more I should say. But uh, I went down to enlist, uh, I went with my buddy. I can't remember his name, really. He was a buddy, all right, but I just, it's been so many, 60 some odd years, I can't remember. And um, he didn't go to my school, so, or my church, so I never knew him that well. And he had one of these elbows, like Senator McCain has, but his is from being a prisoner. He was born this way, you know, or some, I don't know what they call it. So I said, okay, I'll go Navy. So we were down together. The Navy took him, arm or no arm, but wouldn't take me. I, I couldn't see the wall, and I was too skinny. So, too tall to be that skinny. He was skinny, but he was short. So, I didn't bother asking the Marines, and the Army Air Force, I'm sure, wouldn't have taken me. But somebody stuck their head out of the door as I was going down the hall from the post office to go home. And I was a little upset and unhappy that they wouldn't take me. And then I heard, psst, psst. I turned around, and there was this big fellow with all sorts of stripes on his arm and medals. And he says, come here, son. So I went in, and I told him, I said, okay, I want to enlist in the cavalry. Okay. I 18? Well, I got ahead of myself there on the 18 thing. I said, yes, I'll bring in my birth certificate. He said, you do that. <laughs> so in the meantime, eat a whole bunch of bananas and we'll give you glasses. Don't worry about that. And the cavalry, and the cavalry. So anyway, my grandfather was a policeman and um, I told him exactly what I did, and uh, he went, he was all for it. Uh, in fact, he was in the Spanish-American War, as a matter of fact, but he never got out of Florida, <laughs> never got to Cuba. <laughs> and, but um, but he was there, he, and he, he was a veteran of the Spanish-American War, so and I thought I'd uphold the the the, um, the name and. Um, what was his reaction when you told him that you... Oh, he was happy as hell. He was happy as hell. I shouldn't use these words. He was very happy uh, that I was uh, going. He, he knew I could do it, and he knew uh, it might straighten me out a little more. Uh, I was bent somewhere, and uh, he said, that's good for you. This will be great. So, um, so okay, I they I went home for a month and then they called me. I ate bananas, and um, so how much did you weigh before you started your banana eating? Huh? How much did you weigh when you? One thirty-five, <laughs> six foot one, and I weighed. Well, I only well I don't weigh that. I do a little more, but not much. And um, they, the Navy didn't didn't want me here, like I said. But the bananas, I weighed at 138, so what the hell? I, I, uh, I didn't put lead in my pocket or anything. I, I knew they'd take me. So anyway, mom was okay on that, and dad finally came around. Of course, grandpa was pushing me in, and um, because he's got a lot of stories from other policemen about me, uh, uh, but, uh, but nothing was ever, uh, I, I never was booked, as it were, because, oh, Dippo, yes. Oh, Officer Frank? Yeah, my grandpa. Okay, go ahead. 
I have a shirt full of apples or pears or something. That kind of nonsense, as kids would do, I guess. And um, so anyway, I guess by this time, oh, they called me and said uh, this and this and the ticket to the train, and they're going to go to Dix, Fort Dix, New Jersey. I said, that's, that's, not, that's not cavalry. Oh, they, you had to be uh, trained or inducted or some damn thing. Oh, they gave me the induction. I swore in. Well, anyway, I had to go through there, to Fort Dix, and um, that's down in New Jersey. <clears throat> and um, there they issued, oh, they issued uniforms and things like that that you needed. Gas mask, <laughs> uniform, uh, overcoat, clothes, etc., duffel bag. And then they slap you on another train, and that's for, uh, with orders to go to uh, Camp Polk, it was called Camp Polk. Camp Polk, Louisiana. Uh, I didn't know about that. But it, That's a long way from Troy, New York. Huh? That's a long way from Troy, yeah, New is, York. Yes, that's where my mother comes in. I went to Camp Polk when she found out where it was located and what it was, a little town outside, it was bad for her son. Um, she actually called a senator or somebody, congressman, and she, she told her, we can't, can be, I think she wrote a letter finally to the, to the Army Fort Polk and that said no names or anything. Somehow, I was never notified, I was told by my sisters that my mother had to go on ape about uh, be, uh, thinking I, <clears throat> I was too young to be uh, around that atmosphere outside of a post during the war. Yeah. So anyway, I, I was satisfied there were no horses. I had a half track, so uh, I was sent to the, why I was sent to the engineers, oh, I'll never know. Um, uh, thank God it wasn't the infantry. Um, I have a very high regard and re uh, respect for anybody that has that blue badge, infantryman. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we got our share, of course, because the tanks couldn't move unless we did. To, it took the mines up, and or we blew up, or I mean, I'm getting ahead of myself. So we. Um, I get to, that was in um, November of 42. The unit was still filling up with cadre and with uh, listies and draftees uh, coming into the army at that point in time. <clears throat> 11th Armored Division was in South Camp. There was Fort Polk was in two, had two camps, so big, North Camp and South Camp. And the 4th Armored, and they come, or 7th Armored, I'm not, 7th Armored was doing the same at North Camp. They were forming and uh, the training. Uh, none of this business of going to boot camp and then going. We went right to our unit, <clears throat> right to our company, platoon, and squad. And they, they take it from there. But what takes place during is <laughs> a word I can't think of. What well, takes takes place when you first go in, and all the training and you have to do was done actually in your own division, your own outfit. Boot camp, kind of your boot right. camp experience. Your boot camp experience. Boot camp, yeah. that's Navy term. Yeah. I don't yeah. want to use that. Sure. I don't like them anyway. Um, <laughs> I get upset when I see one. Um, so anyway, we went through that, that in Fort Polk, we went out on maneuvers. Um, <laughs> the first sergeant had a unique way of <clears throat> meting out uh, disciplinary action. And uh, once you crossed him, <clears throat> if anybody knows Louisiana and out in the swamps and the sand, you're handed a shovel and you have to dig a, well, it depends how much, how bad you were 
or what you like, not showing up perfectly or, or not reporting to the mess hall to, to work in the kitchen. Um, he would put you to digging holes in the ground. That didn't make sense, but it was a lot of work. Uh, two by twos or four by fours, depending on what you did. And one of my buddies who will show, who took all those pictures, uh, Ray Bush, who's since um, passed. And um, for example, on a bivouac one time during the maneuvers, the the um, unit pack, uh, par, uh, camp put up their tents here where he told them. So Bush and I did. We didn't like that. We went far, further off in the woods where they couldn't find it. That was two more holes we had to dig when we got back. Or one time they caught us with balloons in our pack sap, knapsack instead of all the stuff you're supposed to carry on a 25 mile hike. And that was stupid. Without, so we put balloons in the damn thing. Anything to make it look like I was. We got caught. And I was small digging in the dirt. <clears throat> Nothing so bad that you went to the stockade. We never, we never were that bad. We were just pranksters, youngsters. No, he was, he was, if he'd lived, he'd be about 93 or 94. Because I failed to mention that I was probably, you no, know, there were a couple of boys in 1925. But they kind of kept it quiet. They were afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, I was afraid. <laughs> I got more trouble. It didn't make any difference. And print of one that I have to tell you, it was funny as hell. I was. Uh, I got to be not Eagle Scout, but I got to be first scout, uh, first class scout. It's a, there's two then there's Eagle. And I never made Eagle. I don't think I run out of paper. No, 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 we're okay. fine, go ahead. I never made Eagle, but I did make first class. And <clears throat> oh, I'll wait, go wait. back to 1939. You got that yes. about the bivouac, and we had to dig a four by four. But there's, there's a lot of holes in Louisiana you're responsible for, it sounds like. <laughs> but two of us. Oh, yeah. I was talking about Ray in the picture. Uh -huh. um, yes, he was, a, uh, most people in the unit were I think there might have been two other guys, but <clears throat> company was 150 men approximately in Auburn, an engineer company. And um, three platoons, this comes into play later on, and three squads, or four, I, keep, I think, I don't know. And in each squad were 10 or 11 people. And um, Bush was a squad leader. Uh, he had had a little time somewhere, not, not prison, but I mean, he could have been, but he, he had a little time somewhere, like, oh, the Boy Scouts. I, was, I got blood, blood sacked there. But it hasn't dissipated yet. See, that's all blood. I fell and that didn't happen. It's supposed to go away, but it didn't. Um, well, oh, Ray. Okay, holes, yes, of course. Um, push me. Well, you were talking about Ray. You were telling me a story about yeah. Ray who had taken Oh, the pictures and squads and yeah. so on. So on. Okay, that, could, that plays a part. Um, anyway, about this time, 41 and 42, General Patton was in North Africa with the 1st and 2nd Armored Divisions. Early on, of course, they were first and second. And uh, uh, orders came down. Uh, no, not there, not a folk. Okay, <clears throat> we trained in swamp areas and, and, the, uh, and the sand and the swamp and the mosquitoes. And, um, their damn mosquitoes were so big they argue whether they're going to eat us here or even take them home, take us home. They're monsters. Oh, Huey Long's bridges we, we did. He, you know, oh, Huey Long, a lot of people won't. But um, he was a crook, 
gangster or everybody else, but he was, he did a lot for the Louisiana. Anyway, all those who rotted out, we rebuilt them, we, 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 we built them. We learned how to do a Bailey Bridge that the British, um, on the Sabine River, the stream river between Louisiana and Texas, um, we were on the Louisiana side, of course. And uh, we, we uh, would never make it across, but we were told, or showed how to, but by British, uh, now come to your tongue. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, and they go around with that thing and bang, bang, and oh, they're crazy. And all this stuff. We didn't go for that. <laughs> That's too much, too much. Anyway, they were there to teach us how to build the Bailey Bridge and to shove it across. You build it, you shove it, you build it, you shove it. And um, we learned that, and we learned, of course, ponton bridges are obvious. These big ponton, pontoons, monsters with an inlay. And, uh, oh, that's a good story with about those. But by the time we get to Camp Cook, um, he taught us how to do the Bailey, we know how to do the other. Um, and I, and all these trainings, and all the, spe they, they, the, the guys were specializing. And uh, I thought I'd like to dynamite, I'd demolition, so I, I, I was being another fellow. That doesn't really surprise me. Huh? That doesn't that surprise, surprise me that you went into demolition. <laughs> the prankster that you are went into I, demolition. Well, you could do with nitrous arch. Yeah, yeah, and it's probably now it's entirely different, I'm sure. But uh, the little blocks of nitrous arch, just the little bitty ones, and I'll tell you what we used to do with those two. Um, they weren't for a uh, personal reason. Anyway, we, we all specialized in something. And mine was in uh, uh, primer cord and nitro starch and uh, poop poop and electric wires and all that. And um, and what the hell is that cord that goes it's instantaneous? Um, primer cord. No, whatever. Anyway, you, le you learn the whole thing so you don't blow yourself up or anybody else in the company. And uh, at that time, that's that's Louisiana time. Maneuvers, uh, each and especially the tanks and the and uh, uh, <clears throat> this plays a part too later on. It had a cavalry, forty first cavalry, and it, it shows in my magazines and stuff. They're the ones that actually got there before anybody else. Um, so their they, uh, division is is comprised of. The reason why the triangles, <clears throat> cavalry, infantry, tanks, armored engineers, ordnance, I think we might have had an ordnance company, a medical company, <clears throat> excuse me, not a company, medical too, because this is talking about our company and they get medical too. Okay, because it, during the actual battle, <clears throat> There's combat command A, B, and reserve. And you don't see your fellow man if he's not in uh, one of these, I mean, if you're not with him in that command. And the reserve doesn't mean they're sitting under a uh, bottom. They're pulled, called into action too sometimes, not sometimes, quite often. Because uh, you're, you're not supposed to back up. So they send up more to help you out. Um, so we're to, also, you, uh, I'm glad you can edit this. Um, You're doing oh, great. Uh, Fort Polk was about two years, uh, 42, 43. About, oh, I guess it wasn't, well, say a year and a half. Then they sent us to Barkley. That's your Texas. You're somewhere out there and there. I don't know what the hell it was all about. Oh, I forgot. While we're on maneuvers in Louisiana, I thought something was up with the old man, the boss, the captain, the company commander, Captain Blackburn. He stepped on a shoe of mine, lost one leg, and tore up another one. Um, where was I? What was I counting? 
something that was happening, uh, something that happened on maneuvers when you were in Louisiana. wanted to catch it before. Oh, that was, okay. We did all the swamp stuff and and, uh, and the desert stuff and, and the mosquitoes and all that crap and learned how to function in that particular environment. So then, oh, hell I got it. Here I am again. I hear, I hear the first sergeant talking to the captain. The first sergeant said, but which one shall we, uh, well, who do we pick out? And I said, well, I'll ask for volunteers. Well, anything to get off the Louisiana maneuvers. So when he, won't, he somebody called the company to attention, uh, I think our platoon leaders, the platoon leaders were second lieutenant, first lieutenant and second lieutenant, and they were told to call the company to attention. This is before we went to Barclay. I, did, I wonder why I didn't remember Barkley. And the first sergeant came out and put his clipboard up, put us at ease, and I already had my hand going up. Who wants to go to Fort Knox? I was already up there. Oh, Dippo's got his hand up. Okay, where am I going? <laughs> Fort Knox, Kentucky. Oh, that sounds like an excitement. Uh, good. What for? Well, it's an armored school, uh, uh, briefing in on armored tactics tech, tech, and stuff. Oh, hear me, I'm a demolition guy. I don't care, I go. So I went. And I, that lasted, oh, four, six weeks, about a month. And in that time, they moved to Barclay. And I wasn't in that particular room. And then they didn't stay there very long. The division didn't stay there very long, apparently, because then they were, the next time I re, uh, Bush called me, he said, we're, we're going to the Mojave Desert. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> and like that, I'd never been there. And uh, so I left there after about three or four days later, and I, they paid my way to, to uh, Camp Cook. They had already left Barkley and gone to Camp Cook. And Camp Cook is right on the Pacific Ocean, about uh, two, almost 200 miles north of Los Angeles, because I don't know of any other uh, point to, to, to get the distance. And we were right on the um, right on the Pacific, and, our, and mostly uh, the artillery was doing their thing, and the, the poor guy pulling the plane, the plane pulling the the thing you shoot at, uh, they were playing with that uh, uh, with with a four a four fifty calibers on the uh, on a stand, and they're firing at that choo -choo -choo. and the field artillery is firing at nothing, just out in the, in the water. Aha! Uh -huh. I said nothing, didn't I? Hmm. Well, every day at a certain time. There, uh, there's a train called the Super Chief, and it starts well, were you north of San Francisco? No, San Francisco. Well, whatever was north of where we were, Camp Cook, and it made its way to Los Angeles and then to Chicago and all that sort of stuff. So. We have three artillery battalions. Well, everything is in threes. We had three artillery battalions, a battalion, and uh, we're, they're tank tracked, but they're open on top, uh, and have a what they call a priest uh, thing. And that was their big weapon. I'm not sure what it was. Seventy-five, maybe. And um, our tanks had seventy-fives, and they had eighty-eights. But anyway. That's another story. Um, say, um, 75s or were the, yeah, there's a howitzer and there's a long gun. Um, the French had the howitzer in World War I, 
uh, 75, I think, at home. So anyway, whatever. It was a pretty good sized show. And they were barring one day, and the super chief was going by when they didn't see it because it wasn't in sight, or they didn't think they saw it. And it went right through the dining car. Oh, Armored Pearson. Nobody, uh, nobody in the dining car, thank God. Nobody was in the dining car. But then the newspaper, the closest uh, place was Bomb Polk or some little kind of shot, in a very small, small place. That's where I learned uh, vodka I never had before, but in this little town at Lompoc, Lompoc. Anyway, the paper. Uh, 11th Armored Division Artillery. <laughs> um, um, I mean, no, it was well phrased. Uh, artillery knocked out, or whatever. The dining car, no one hurt. But well, that was there. Okay, that was the artillery. We were working on minefields. Um, they would bury them, but they would say there was nothing in them, thank God. And we were taught how to properly do it. Yeah. And uh, what you see in every movie now, uh, cowboy, I mean, War II movie, you use your bayonet to pissing and you find it, you call somebody, hmm, what do I do now? And this is how we learned to do that. And then the Bangalore torpedo come in. They're very active on D-Day. You build your torpedo like you build the Bailey Bridge. Boom, push, boom, push. Loaded with explosives all the time, each time. And then down, push, push. They use them once they, once they got a foothold on the bay, on D-Day, they were able to blow the fences, mm -hmm. the, the uh, whatever was in their way, uh, by pushing the Bangalore torpedoes up there and then igniting it at the sun. Well, we 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 did so well that General Bradley was came out. I don't know what his position was then. Army Chief of Staff, probably. Yeah. Uh, General Bradley. Uh, we were all introduced to him. And um, uh, he went to everybody's unit, the infantry, the artillery, the, all the engineers, and um, and he came out and saw us on the Bangalore, and they put a light charge in him just so to excite the old man, I guess. And uh, we blew one up in an imaginary fence, and uh, he says, well, you guys are ready. Now here we are, uh, Polk. Barkley, oh no, that's Cook. Where went the San, uh, the what's it called, Mojave Desert? Mm -hmm. Back up here. After Barkley, I met him and in, in, uh, in, uh, I told you. Whoop. Yeah, went to the Mojave uh, Desert. You yeah, met him there. I met him at uh, at uh, Mojave, and that was tent living, and um, the big thrill there was, uh, well, live ammunition. Uh, even for us riflemen, uh, uh, it was live, all live, because there's nothing out there but, but uh, what do you call those two? Tarantulas and whoop, whoop. scorpions. Yeah. yeah. Who said that? I said it. You did. I, I did. thought it was somebody yeah. back there. <laughs> well, we used to put them in a fight. We'd catch them and put them in a fight. And another thing that was kind of different out there, <clears throat> there was a a uh, five-gallon receptacle outside of each tent of eight, ten men. But you know what the hell that was. The last one out had to empty it and <laughs> it about ten yards up to the latrine and uh, slop, slip, slop and everything else. And I t told most people, dip the tent, come on, we don't want tent. They'd be crazy. These nuts let them do what they want. They're crazy. If we just outside, if it ain't big enough, go outside. But don't do it. The thing I'm I'm using the last one out because I'm I'm a slow uh, in the morning. I, I just can't wake up. And let me see what else out there. We had live ammunition. We had scorpion pipes. We had pecans. 
and um, down to empty. And then we got went out to cook, and that's when they were told we were told we were ready. <laughs> we were ready, all right. Two and a half years practically training. Some guys go to boot or something for six weeks, and they're off and they're with the gun, bang. <clears throat> well, we did run the army, and the army needed us. So like, oh, here's one where the where the pontoons came in. We had a program. The, mil the government did, the military did, it, called ASTP, Army Specialized Training Program. You're aware of this? Yes, sir. For the bright boys. And they sent them all to college. Still, I'm, I'm still where I am. All mine came from what I learned, read, and absorbed. And um, so they came in. Well, after you've been in the de uh, Louisiana, Barkley again, I don't know, out in the desert, freezing at night and sweating in the morning, to have a bunch of pansies coming, a well, boop, boop, not necessary, there are two very, uh, uh, these young men coming in, all with fingernail piles and bathrobes and everything, oh, it was, it was pathetic. And you could sense there was a division. These people were not welcome. Mm -hmm. It's almost like prison. A new guy, you know. We, we don't want nothing to do with you. You're in our unit, this is what you do. Oh, I don't tell them that. I mean, the, the plume sergeant and the platoon lieutenant. Uh, they were uh, separated and moved out and each one of the platoons. So the old man, the one that later stepped on our shoebox, mm -hmm. Colonel Black, uh, uh, Captain Blackburn, nice little fella, became a dentist after a war and then he died here some time ago. Um, I should never go sidetracking. Oh, you were about you know, the old man yeah. uh, sensed it, mm -hmm. and uh, first sergeant didn't really care one way or the other. He was the big, big cockaroo, so he, he, he didn't bother him. But the old man could sense that there was, there was this. We weren't a unit the way he wanted, and going into combat eventually, that that would not be good. So what does he do? He says, <laughs> he, 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 we had a, a big generator that blew up those contours, and that goes with you into combat as well, because somebody's got to blow them up. And um, I, heard, I didn't hear this, he, he must have, this is after the fact. And uh, he he told Pinky to um, blow up a pond right now. No, this is Friday, Friday night. Okay, sometime Friday. He Pinky had to go. He did too. Pinky had to go and get a and blow up a, 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 a pontoon and put it out in the in the in the um, our our space area between the barracks. Okay, that was done, and then he sent the first sergeant into town with a credit card and said, I want 24 cases of beer and all the ice you can handle. Well, the, the answer is, is already in your mind. We all got drunk. <laughs> Everybody became buddy. Everybody was their buddy's friend. Now that was a smart man mm -hmm. that thought of that. He's he said, and most of the guys that were with me in that platoon are gone. I used to one neck. I had three Italian fellows. Did I tell you on the phone about the Italian fellow? No. Gaetano Giovanni Ferragelli. Carmine Valentino, oh, oh, Carmine Valentino, and he was only about five foot three or four, and 
na that nature of that blood. And uh, Gaetano Giovanni Paragelli was a <laughs> something else. And um, one other one, I can't remember his name. I also an Italian. Because my unit, the division, was about 30% First Service Command, which was from Maine down to Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, and New York. A lot of Italians in that area. And in fact, Paragelli was from uh, Philadelphia, Borden Wharton. And they kind of ingrate, I maybe I ingrate it myself to them, or they thought this was something new, me, and uh, Fata Jolly, they used to be. You speak Italian? I don't, no. No, Fata Jolly, it means pale face. Fata Jolly. And they all carried a knife. Oh, a nice knife. Oh, and, a choop, whoop. and they taught me. We go into town. Oh, mother, I forgot about her. But she did write a letter, and, and she, my son uh, closed up all those institute, those things, and uh, don't let him go to town or some damn thing. But well, that's history. <clears throat> but but, but uh, we go to town, and, and in those days, we, when we got dressed, we had a, a long coat with a nice Sam Brown belt, so on and so forth, and they take the belt off, and they find a table over there in the corner, of course dragging me along with them, and uh, I do the same, take it off. And then I see them wrap it around their, <laughs> wrap it around their fist, around their hand. And then they order their drinks. First they got the back, the wall on their back, and they got the thing under the thing wrapped on the and a knife in their pocket. Well, then we could have gone to a stockade, but but uh, uh, I never got in trouble. I never got hurt. Never got touched. If anybody began to came near me, you'd think I was to, you know, the golden goose. Uh, I wasn't. There was. We're all making twenty-two dollars a month. It didn't make any difference. But they thought because of my name that I might have had some Italian blood. So I let them think so. And I even went so far as to saying, really, our name is Dippolito. Now, look at the phone book in New York, you'll find Dippolito, Dippolito, Dippolito. Oh, but the, but the, blonde, the blonde hair, the blue eyes? Northern Italy is a but Austria? Yeah, they must have came over. So well, anyway, as far as I was concerned, I was their, I was their number one man, boy, because they were all older than I was, and I learned things from them that I'll never, never forget. Anyway, I was so protected. So now we're in Camp Cook. We we've been to the desert. That was terrible. And um, then, of course, my method of, of urinating was fine. They, my people liked us because they didn't have to carry that damn thing. Again, not my people. I'm still a private. No, private first class by this time. Praying for corporal, I guess. To, 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 to. And um, so Cook, okay, then we go to Dix again, or to New Jersey somewhere, and board a ship. And this is September or October. D-Day was June. We were training for almost two years. <clears throat> oh, I told you about the ASTP. We all became, became buddies and friends. And in fact, there was one, one fellow, my idol, he had a bathroom, he had slippers, he had a cuticle cutter, <laughs> and all that stuff in the barracks at Camp Cook when he joined us. Anyway, he made uh, battlefield commissions, as a matter of fact, second lieutenant. He's a lawyer, uh, he's dead now. He was probably five or six years older than I was. Yeah, I tried to think of his name. I got it in there. I got the whole company roster. 
and all the ones that are alive, but it's dated, obviously. And anyway, anyway. So now we're on a ship and we're going, going to uh, uh, Southampton. <clears throat> so it's October by now, and uh, we did uh, we did some turning there. Uh, I guess I got more more Brits with us again, and. Um, I'm trying to think of the time, Melksham, it was in Dubbertshire, not far from Southampton, as a matter of fact. Okay, so we go aboard, we go across, and we were, uh, I guess our orders were to go to St. Nazaire. Now that was north of Paris. And our assignment was to, man, to uh, contain the G German soldiers that were left behind, that we, they bypassed them. And uh, I think, I don't know who the hell was holding them in before we got there, unless they already got to the, uh, were sent out somewhere. And it could have been the 90th Infantry, but I'm not sure. Anyway, that was our assignment. The whole division, not just CCA, not just CCB or R. The whole division was assigned to this one mission. Well, we had that for about three weeks. No, October, moving we across to November, so. Okay, we had that for about early December. So we had that mission for about three months. And then we got the orders to get our butt up to Bastogne as fast as we could go. Without stopping. And so we did. I guess some of you, you practically, I think you know, uh, we made it 36 hours or so, something of, that made the papers anyway. Yeah, the forced march yeah. that you went on? I was a day and night, and it meant nothing, just keep going. Yeah, what do you remember from that? You remember that day? No, what do you remember from that march? Uh, I don't, because in St. when at the beginning of the Ardennes, there's a French town, God forbid. <coughs> I can't remember that. Right there, then the Ardennes Forest town. But anyway, we had stopped for some reason, had mechanicals, whatever, somebody on the, on the line. And up comes all these people with Calvados. I never, I thought vodka was Calvados will kill you. Well, we, <laughs> we were loaded down with Calvados by the time we got to uh, outside of Bastogne. So I really don't quite remember too much about it. <laughs> I wasn't the driver. The uh, driver was, I don't know who he was, I forget, he was a farmer from Arkansas or something. I don't know, one of the old timers anyway. So uh, they hadn't, it had started the snow. Um, by this time it's December 13, 12, 13, 14, something like that. And I think I told you, maybe I didn't, but uh, oh, I'm starting to think we couldn't leave where we were very far because the tanks couldn't get us out of there. Uh, we stayed where we were. I probably. <laughs> probably 10 miles from that stone itself. And uh, there wasn't much we could do except <coughs> the Ardennes. We, we saw it, I think that moved, and it wasn't one of ours, shoot them. And then that's where the, where, um, because we got the warning that the, the uh, they had to put on our uniforms and it started infiltrating. Um, see, this had come first. That happening happened. Then when we were on guard duty one night, Bush, me, 
a couple other guys, usually four or five, at night on a, on a roadway coming past our particular place. Uh, you might have to cut this out, and it may be not, but it's, it's, it's real, it's true, and it was meant in good faith. And we heard the tank wheels, but they make an awful lot of noise, as you know. And uh, Bush put the light, no, Mama Bush didn't put the light on him. He yelled at him, he had a big voice too, told him to halt, stop, and the motors stop. And then he asked for the password. We didn't even know it really, but the guy got hesitation, and then we see a light and a flashlight in a man's hand shining on his face. He says, you ain't seen any black Germans yet. It was a black unit, separated. Segregation was still, obviously, until 48, and we were a segregated army. Um, though the Red Bull Express, we couldn't have done anything without them. That's to have ammunition and food and gas and coming from the various ports that we had liberated, uh, all the way to Belgium. Uh, that was all by uh, the black soldier troops, and um, but when he said that, <laughs> we we felt we could go through the whole night and not worry. But that's one little humorous part of that. And then while we were in, oh, I mentioned Carmine. Okay, we paired up. Remember, I'm six foot one, and Carmine's about five foot four. And you, this, this foxhole business is only when you're maintaining a position, uh, like like they did when the, the, we were stuck behind them, uh, couldn't get out of the Rhine, couldn't get across the Rhine, we would have foxholes. Otherwise, you have a slit trench. Well, that's where the nitrous charge came, <laughs> came in, because there's noise going everywhere and a tree burst and screaming at me and nobody would so we'd pick a hole the best we could and uh, then stick a nitro go a square of nitro starch in there and run like hell and then i go damn and then we got a start on it it didn't dig the hole but it did break the hard so we had to dig it but the story the, 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 the crux of this story is when you lay out, I lay out six foot one. Carmine gets five foot three, he stopped digging. He don't dig anymore. <laughs> I said, crazy, Carmine. I said, hey, it's all your bubba, not my fault. No, he didn't use the word bubba, because that's strictly Texas. And um, <laughs> I thought that was funny, because he had enough to keep really warm. We froze our feet, really, but we didn't. Our bodies, we had the uh, overcoats, nice big heavy overcoats and jackets and shirts and shit, stuff you never changed for weeks. And socks too, you never changed, hardly, though they wanted you to change them as often as you could. It made sense, but it's pretty hard to kick off your boots and uh, in that kind of weather. So we didn't. Anyway, um, somebody else was, uh, the, the, that was the 87, I mean the 101st Airborne, uh, the, the battered bastards of Bastogne. Everybody knows of them and, and and what they did and what McCollum said to the Germans and everything that's in movies. But it's all, that part is all true. Um, you know where I was, I think. And, uh, but the 82nd Airborne, the elements of it, there were still regiments. We were battalions. We used to be regiments, but it didn't work. So uh, that's when the old British four square. Um, ours were strictly battalions. They they have regiments. They still have them, I guess. And they came out of France with their short coat, their flashy boots, and their carbines. Of course, the ones that fall. Hmm. We got that big nine pounder. Hmm. 
I bet they'd like some overcoats and some galoshes. I knew the supply sergeant quite well. In fact, I have a picture of him somewhere we're both drinking together. And his, he's gone. Um, what would our mother wouldn't know? Um, I had that picture too just recently. Hennigan, a good old Irishman. And uh, of course he liked his, uh, I didn't mind. I was learning all this. By this time, I'm uh, Boston, December, you figured out, that was six, 44 from 25. And I was, that's how old it was in the, bill, in, in the bulbs at Bastogne. And um, it was slow going, obviously. And uh, Well, now you were talking about this deal. You made a deal with the supply sergeant with the with the British, y'all made it. Oh, I just forget about that. Yeah, <laughs> she gave us the galoshes and the overcoat. We lost people. We got overcoats. We lost people. We got galoshes. It, it's a brutal saying, but it really it isn't. Like I told you on the phone, that's war. The other is not war. And uh, so I said, I think I can get us some of those fancy carbines. Hoo -hoo -hoo. So I got carmine mixed up with carbine, and uh, he said, "Sure, go ahead, do what you can do with him." And because uh, he got tired of carrying that carbine, I mean that thing, nine pound Garand, wonderful rifle though, Jesus, fire, and that's no automatic, semi-automatic. You go through a clip just like that, bam, another one. And we used to have a bandolier on, uh, carried about one, two, three, four, five, six about six clips of six of six uh, rounds or whatever the capacity was so we didn't trade any of that stuff but we got about four of the paratroopers to give up their uh, what you call it to take our big rifle if they could have that uh, overcoat but this time they're slouching and the snow is up to here we're used to it now and they've got those beautiful, you know, beautiful boats and those little half coats. What do they call them? Pea coat. The Navy would call them. The Navy would call them pea coats. It's a little shorty. And I said, hey, you're going to need these, boy. And sure, it took a while. Everybody didn't jump on it, but it took a while. And we got poor coverage. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, we didn't hurt our fellow man or in any way. We gave him apparel and they had a weapon. Of course it was heavier than most of them. <laughs> no, no, no. And that's another joke. But anyway, that's real. Um, we made it to, we broke out. Oh, the reason we couldn't break out, uh, or we, everybody, Combat Command A, I don't know where B was. We were about, like I said, about 10 miles this side of on the road, or off the road, of Bastogne itself, which was a mess, tore apart. That was our first aid station, though, in Bastogne. Uh, first aid station where you go if you're wounded. And um, uh, we got out of Bastogne. Our, our mission was to link with the Brits coming down from Ber uh, Belgium. <clears throat> And we had an army coming up from the south, and us in the middle, so we were supposed to meet and make our solid front then to go mm -hmm. all, all, uh, on to Europe to, to win the war. Um, uh, along the way, we, uh, we lost a lot of people to tree burst. They just didn't, the replacements. They were, they were gung ho and all that crap. Uh, but but if you're in, a, like I said, if you're in an area, they've already been there. This is after the bug, beyond the, mm -hmm. beyond uh, woods. They were pushing them back further and further and further. We're trying to get them back over the Rhine. They, Eisenhower, everybody was man over there. We finally linked up from the south, from the from the north, because they wanted Antwerp. 
If they can get Antwerp and ruin our, our income of, uh, every time we lose a tank, we get three more. Mm -hmm. You lose a man, we got five more coming in. What do I, I get excited. Um, but that's the way it is. The, the, the damn fool was on fighting on how many fronts? Enough to do, that's what, that, I'm afraid we're going to get in, we have gotten in that position. I mean, I'm not political in any way. Uh, I just don't see us doing what we're doing and why we're doing it. But anyway, that's something else. Uh, where was I? So, you'd, you'd finally linked up with the Brits. You'd li linked up with the British Army. Oh, yeah. the British and then the Seventh Army from yeah. from the South, and then we'd started. Everybody started on their own. Each army. Patton was my army, and um, what there was something I wanted to say about the Rhine. <sighs> anyway. We never, oh, somebody, a scuttlebutt had it that when the general was holding court and some new replacements or, uh, came in or something, he was talking and briefing or doing and tell them, um, ever forward and always come pushing that to them and they keep going. And somebody did ask him to go sideways. He stripped that kid right away. It's probably um, Young second lieutenant, first lieutenant. What if we have to go over the thing? That makes sense, though. But he took it wrong, and he had a temper, and he was crazy, and and they he sent somebody out to defrock him. If they defrock soldiers, I know they do, my priest. And uh, um, so once we got across. Well, we had a lot of bridge work to do, and a lot of the Hungarians, oh, airplanes. Um, the ceiling didn't lift. Remember now, 12, we were watching their, their flashes, and, and then uh, they'd be watching our flashes. I use our, but the tankers and the artillery, of course, they were mobile, the, both the artillery and the, they could move. So I think they finally got smart and did that. <laughs> They'd shoot and move, shoot and move, and then look at their flash and be ready to shoot at that flash. But then the ceiling lifted and the thunderbolts came out, P-47s. Heavy plane, not very maneuverable, well-armed, well-armored, and could really raise hell with a column. Had a little cannon, I think, even a 20 millimeter or something, whatever. And um, and they came out, and then we just Katie barred the door. We all combat command A went that way. Came out. Oh, I know what we did. A and B uh, took off for Luxembourg. Oh, A did, or Mike, I B must have been behind him. There wasn't that much resistance in in uh, Luxembourg that I can uh, I can put my finger on. <clears throat> they were well entrenched, but uh, we lost a lot of people in, in Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. And um, if you ever been to Ham, that's where the, the sir, that's where the cemetery, one of the biggest cemetery. And there's one in Bastogne. I've been. Oh, I have been back because we have a daughter. That one, the little one on that side, on the left side. Um, the top one is 1950. That one's 1958. That one's 1962. I don't know their ages, but I know when they were born. Um, where was it going? With you were talking about going back. That you've gone. Oh, back. going yeah. back. <clears throat> Going back, uh, when the number when the number two there uh, has been over there since well 22 years, and before her husband was killed in, in an accident, they're both bikers, and um, she had her own bike, and, and it's tough for a woman to get a bike uh, uh, permit. As it is, she also had a hunting permit. 
uh, it took her a while, but she took out of her company sent her. I said I'm going all over the place. Her company sent her to Dublin for uh, a meeting from Germany. She works for the Japanese. It's a, it used to be the R.J. Reynolds cigarette business, tobacco, and um, the Europe and the Eastern smoke like like chimneys. We're not. You know, they don't come home. There's no money here, and uh, they sent her to uh, uh, Dublin for a uh, meeting and so on and so forth. And she and some others. And uh, one of them was to trap you. They didn't know <laughs> that she'd already had to qualify with a 30 odd six, which happens to be one of her weapons from her husband. Um, so they, um, some maybe might have hit a pigeon or something. She got 19 out of 20. And at 12 gauge, I said, you're crazy. Four ten for a woman. No, Dad, 12 gauge. I had a bruise for a month. <laughs> but she's tough. She's alone now. He, um, he, um, he came out to, to, uh, going pretty fast and met some idiot coming out going pretty fast. Uh -huh. And both were on the side of their hill. They came over the hill, bang. He was a big truck and he was a motorcycle. Wow. 30 foot in the air, down, wow. broke his body all the butt. That's been about a year now. She's been home since. Uh, anyway, I'm sorry. so yeah. I don't know where we well, were. Are you, are you as good a shot? Were you as good a shot as she is? Were you as good a shot oh, as yeah, she I is? Can hardly make, I can hardly lift that trucker. I did get shot her. I did get shot and I did shoot it. Five going 100, 200, 500. I did shoot it at basic, you know, not basic, uh -huh. but a company uh, teaching you all how to do it. Yes, I got shot, but it's in my book. It's on my DD 214, man. I don't know what score it was, but no, it wasn't like that. 19 out of 20. I didn't know how many bullets I got, but I got enough, yeah. I did. Uh, you should ask that. Sharpshooter, yes, no. Now, I mean, no, the next one up, no, there's three. This, this, and then that, that one. Expert. Uh, it's yeah. called expert and sharpshooter. This is <laughs> whatever. The bottom of the line. Oh, that damn thing. I couldn't hardly hold a sucker. But um, put a bayonet on, I fell over. Um, well, not really. That's a <laughs> joke. <laughs> um, okay, so we're in Luxembourg. And. Um, <clears throat> I must have slept all through it. I can't remember too much the work we had to do. Oh, we had to we had to blow some um, abbots. They would build. <coughs> they would fell trees. That's one way um, to get in our way to hold us up. Um, uh, but then they would build these fantastic, filled with dirt and stones and everything out into the road far enough to where you couldn't get a tank through or a truck, you could get a horse through maybe. And we had to blow those suckers up. And um, and we didn't repair any bridges in, in Luxembourg. When the, the Germans finally started running out, they started doing the work I probably would have done, uh, blowing up bridges that had already been because they didn't want their bridges blown up for damn sure. And, um, but you can't go into Luxembourg. I have a hat for Luxembourg. They gave me a medal, as a matter of fact. I have a picture of that. Um, my one visit to my daughter, the, the one that lives there, and then the one that <clears throat> lives in Houston, Barbara, their number one daughter, uh, and her husband. When we traveled to Europe, they, they always went with us. <clears throat> and uh, between the two of them, Annie and her, and her uh, ability to speak fluent German, of course Luxembourg doesn't much care for the German, but they do speak German. And uh, they speak English too. 
the Dutch speak more English so than North Berlin. Anyway, <clears throat> um, so we went over uh, one of our visits. We used Space Metal. We used to. Now Kelly's closed up and so on. Then we started going. And then, and then uh, oh, Mother and I just decided we can't fly anymore. I couldn't hear for a month, not really, but a long time. Mother got sick. So we don't, she comes home. We take care of her and bring her home. It's much, much easier. But, I'm, but every time when we used to go over, um, of course, that's when she lived in Cologne. And, 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 and um, Frankfurt was in our hands. I mean, the airport, half of it was anyway. At one time, all of it, but then they had to give it back to the half of it at least. And we would land at Frankfurt and we'd take the train down to, uh, to Cologne and she'd meet us and so on and so forth. But now she lives closer to Trier, uh, which is where the Japanese have their uh, cigarette company. There's 1,500 people in it anyway. There's a, it's a big outfit. I, I, th I guess they manufacture it or well, whatever. And um, <clears throat> so, and then they would meet us at, 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 um, at the oh, airport, I mean at the Cologne, when we, when we used to go in base available, they'd meet us in Cologne. Then we started flying, we'd fly into Luxembourg City, which also Luxembourg uh, City. And the first time I got in, I see you there. What the hell did I do for guys? Speak up, you know, because everybody's patting everybody down. Oh, huggy, huggy, kissy, kissy. Thank you, thank you. So on one of those trips, <laughs> they got a hold of the museum curator, curator in Luxembourg and said, we're going to bring Dad over. We want to see the museum here. And he was, you know, a, who he was and what he was and so on and so forth. And um, I didn't know any of this at all. And so it's, it's outside of um, a small town, this museum. And it's and people are lined up to go through and so on and so forth. So we got to the What's that word I want? Tableau. Tableau? Tableau. Uh, all set out with the cold and the winter time and, mm -hmm. and Bastogne and whatever. <clears throat> and, 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 and the, and the um, guy that was taking us around, I have that picture by the way. I can't find my medal. Uh, <clears throat> they had called him ahead of time and said, my dad is member of the summer people and so oh yeah sure we, we know them that yeah, they sure, they liberated us so um, so okay I didn't know any of this and going through talking and I'm listening and I'm asking questions and we get to the tableau that shows depicts uh, winter uh, military action in the middle in the winter and they stop and they talk and then he came, is Mr. Dippo in the audience? He didn't know me from Adam. They pointed me out. My son-in-law was hiding over there when he was alive then. But he didn't care that, about the war. He was only a baby, I guess, when he, <clears throat> when he was going, when this was going on. No, but he's a lawyer, he was a good lawyer too. And um, I, they pointed to me and then, he started told me, and I saw him. Uh, somebody opened a box, <clears throat> and I saw him looking at me, and I saw him putting his hands in the box. And he pulls out this medal, and he comes towards me. Are you going to kiss me? That's silent. I went that silent. I didn't dare use my voice. Are you going? Cause I'm like, come on. They, 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 no, I didn't know what he was going to do. He said, no. He put the medal on my 
shook my hand, and he, I had to, he asked me to say, of course, uh, I extemporaneously, thank God, I knew something. And uh, I gave him a lot of BS stuff, it was nice. And, uh, and then a, a, a fellow in uniform steps forward, and as introduced as Colonel so and so of Luxembourg Army. And he pins a Luxembourg flag on my on my uh, shirt or whatever the hell I had on. And uh, really that uh, that made my day. It made for a long time. I raised hell with the kids, but but uh, when I think about it I didn't mind. And uh, it, I didn't get any Bronze stars or anything, but I got a medal of honor. That's the kind we have, just all honor. Uh, not doesn't mean activities, you know. I mean, uh, it could have been just being a nice guy and saving the other ass. That's all. So, but I, but it was um, it was quite a. I wish I I got the picture, but I don't have the medal. But the picture I'm doing, I I could find all that stuff. I got an idea. I bought a whole sack, almost a whole sack, I ate quite a few of them, of 18 count shrimp. You know what that means? Oh yes, I know what a shrimp is. You know is. what that means? Yeah. They're pretty good size. <laughs> and we have extra special, my special cheese. What the hell is it called? Credit cheddar. It might be cheddar white, but I think it's cheddar red. And then whatever the hell they got cooked up out there, why don't we take a break and have some refreshment? Would you like to take a break? Sure. Okay, all right. All right, uh, Mr. Dippo, when we left off, you had us in Luxembourg. Can you pick up kind of your story from there? Well, I, that thing that I told you was personal, uh, I don't think in there too, about the medal and all that. Yes, sir, you told us that, yeah. Well, when we got during the war, when we liberated Luxembourg, I was not aware of it. <laughs> there was Luxembourg, uh, just another city, another town, another nation. Well, I guess I knew it was Luxembourg, but I didn't anything particular stick in my mind, stuck in my mind, or get stuck in my mind. And, uh, but since I have a daughter, we have a daughter living in uh, Germany at Trier. Well, it's really outside of Trier in a Kleiner shot, a small, a small town outside of Trier. She commutes to work in Trier and Trier, to Luxembourg Airport, where she lived. I mean, to, to, from where she lives to, to Luxembourg Airport is about 25 kilometers, and so it was easy access and so on and so forth. But, and we've been through Luxembourg Airport on a number of occasions when we visited our daughter in, uh, in Germany. And every time, of course, I wear my hat, Wherever I go, I'm proud of it, and uh, I'm sure you know what hat I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, <laughs> and um, every time I land there, and it's been on such at least three occasions, years apart, and um, I'd always have people staring at me, especially the people that. Are, are in charge of security, and it makes me feel uneasy, even today, <laughs> to, to this day. Um, but the people really recognize the fact that it was our 11th Armored Division and General Patton's army that liberated the city of Luxembourg and its Ambines, its other kind of towns around. We liberated the, the ones that the Germans had held. And all of Luxembourg wasn't under the German shield. But the ones that were, 
um, was very the whole city, the whole country uh, treats us uh, us meaning anybody in the military period, whether it's Eleventh Armored or not. But since it was our division that liberated them, they feel a closeness to us, mm -hmm. and we they. Um, one of my visits, my mother and I. Did you, when did I? I think you told us that about getting the medal. Yeah. You told us about I'm getting the medal. I've already told him, Yes, sir. Oh, you, I did? You told us that story. Good. Erase all that other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. but, Where am I then? Well, you you can take us back to... Uh, oh, we haven't taken the war yet. No, we're, oh, in, okay. we're in the war and we're in Luxembourg. Oh, Luxembourg. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, Luxembourg was a success and uh, we left there. The, uh, we left a lot of men. But um, that's war. And then we headed for, I really, I'm not sure what our aim was except to cross the Rhine. And uh, then from there on, that was a struggle. Um, the bridges, a lot of them were blown, a lot of bridges had to be repaired, and then pont bridges had to be um, made and set up so the tanks could get across. And uh, they made us hell for us, they, but um, just think afterwards you're going to have to make it all over. So anyway, we next big operation really is one of General Malus. Oh, that wasn't too bad. They made ammunition and pistols and what have you. In other words, by the time we got. Uh, Hundred miles into, or sixty miles into Germany, there was hardly any resistance, and uh, people uh, had been told by the military government by phone. Uh, phone lines were intact. If they were, they would call ahead and and say the division of so and so, Eleventh Army Division, Combat Command A is headed your way, and. Uh, by this time we had 90 millimeters as opposed to 75, but the war was uh, winding down. If you hang out your sheets, uh, white sheets, and, and, and uh, uh, you'll not be bothered. We'll run right through your city and uh, go keep going. And our object was to get to, <laughs> General Patton's object was to get to <clears throat> Lynch Austria before the Russians, because the Russians were told by political uh, dealings that they could have all the way to the Danube, but not on the German side. How did I got twisted? I don't know. Since we all know they had, no, they had part of Berlin. Okay, um, the, the Russians were being a little bit late getting there, so we our we were had our objective, our mission that particular day that we took off was to um, liberate um, Mauthausen concentration camp. Prior to our leaving the day before, I'll back up on the sixth of May. The uh, 11th Armored Division Combat Command A cavalry, armored cavalry, got there first. And uh, <clears throat> I, I didn't think, I, well, I was independent, there wasn't anybody there, any Germans there, uh, well, in uniform anyway, or armed. Uh, that's the way I was. Uh, uh, Told, anyway, but uh, the war still hadn't ended. But the, the, the uh, cavalry sent out uh, help, asking for uh, medical help immediately, and um, of course the uh, purification would be our job, uh, um, which we didn't get to till the next day on the seventh of May. Seventh uh, of May, we. The rest of the uh, Combat Command A arrived at Mauthausen concentration camp. 
and uh, what we beheld and what we saw and I'm sure I speak for my comrades was worse the condition of the people and what had transpired prior to our arrival was worse than the battlefield. They were terrible. They were covered with swords. They weighed 70 pounds. They were, if they were alive at all, they were didn't go over 70 pounds. And they were all sick and had lice. And, and it was terrible. But the um, medicos got in there that afternoon in force. They set up a tent to triage, but they didn't have to triage. Everybody was the same, practically. But they took care of the women and children and uh, at first, and they uh, gave them first aid and, and uh, gave them shots and, and, and operated on them and, and uh, sent them back further back into a more station hospital, a station hospital. A mass unit, more or less, and then from there they could go on if they were still alive. But what we did, the engineers, we dug, we had, we had a, a trench dug by our dozers, and uh, I recall it was um, at least 15 yards long and uh, over six feet deep and at least five yards wide. And all the bodies had been stacked already, <clears throat> mostly on flatbeds, but some on the ground. And uh, our commanders, our military commanders, military government commanders, made it known to the burgomaster of the adjoining the village that they were to show up at, at such and such a time and then really that would have been the 8th of May the next day because all our work was done all day long we also we set up a water purification but we didn't do the delousing it was done by the medics and um, um, so the, the government, colonel from the uh, military uh, uh, government people, uh, like I said, ordered the burgomaster of that little village, I forget the name, uh, to attend uh, the burial of the, of, the, of the deceased. And that they were to wear their finest clothes and no gloves. And they were to take each skeleton, each body down into the hole. Well, you could hear, we didn't know. We didn't know. It still echoes in my ear that they didn't know what transpired. The stench of the ovens would have, should have given it away, but it was, didn't even need that. It was obvious what was going on in that in, in close area. Mott housing. It would go down as infamy, as man's worst in humanity to man. You know, you, you had said it was worse than a battlefield. What what made it worse oh, than the battlefield? Because okay. you had seen, you had seen many battlefields. So oh. what, what made this worse? Uh, I had mentioned earlier that the scene that we beheld when we went into Mauthausen, was really 
the living dead. And in that sense, battle casualties, and especially in winter, they freeze and you, it doesn't get to you as badly as it does when you see a, a human walking like he's dead. Especially in the winter time, the, your, your wound heals, or not heals, but the blood is coagulated very fast, and uh, if the medics get to you fast enough, you won't freeze. But you, most of the young men in my outfit that were hurt like that, or injured, were wounded, thanks to God that they had the cold weather to um, help them with their wounds, to help them uh, um, um, it, it, it coagulated better, faster than it did. But to see these human beings walking and shuffling and mumbling and they don't know what to do and what's going on, they, they, it's, it would, was terrible, it was pretty hard to take for most of us. That's it. Um, I know for a lot of veterans, you know, these are images that have stayed with you. And, and it, it really doesn't stay with me, but if I mention it or even think about it, it I, I get emotional. It, it's just, I can't help it. Yeah. Because it's there, it'll never go away. But, uh, and, and then you see it in the museums and you see it on, on television even. Well, you don't get a close look, but I have seen my house on television as well. But now it's all dolled up and then of course they can't go back and show those pictures on, on, on television, of course. But it is something that should never, never, never happen again. I don't care what we have to do to stop it. I'd be the first to go yeah. if they take me. Help me. Well, you, so you were there for the ceremony that you had on the oh. 8th to bury the... Yeah. I forgot. I, 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 my mind is wandering. I'm sorry. Um, after the, uh, like I told you, the uh, Burgermeister was, uh, brought his people up and they were in their what they would call Sunday clothes, and they did not have gloves. And they kept, like I kept saying, like I say, they kept saying we didn't know, we didn't know this existed. Well, we all know they knew. Uh, then the burial, we had a chaplain from every religion say, after our dozers covered, it was our dozers that covered them over. Then we had to, the, the, not we again, the, the, the commanding general had all the chaplains of all the faiths that was represented in, represented in our division. I couldn't, I'm sure there weren't any religions that weren't represented here. And a, a, a mass was said, a, uh, the Koran was read, or what? Not the Koran. It's the, what the Jewish have. Torah. The Torah. Uh, the Torah was read from, and all everybody, all the uh, 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 chaplain and the, the people uh, of the uh, city, the town, had to stay right with us. And believe it or not, some of them knelt while this was going on, because Europe. If you go way back, before the other religions came, it was always the Catholic religion. And they were kneeling and crying and, and moaning that they didn't know. And that's when we were reassigned to our real jobs that we should do. I had a lucky job. I had to defuse the Adolf Hitler Bridge, which separated Austria from Germany, 
a German town, I think was called Schwanestadt. Um, and uh, sure enough, it was there. It was there. It was dynamite sticks, and it wasn't. It wasn't uh, um, any other explosive that I didn't understand. It was dynamite sticks, and um, all set to be activated. But of course, it wasn't. And then I we, we ordered out, ordered north again on German territory to blow up a minefield because civilians had been injured. So they knew that it was, in, I mean, it was in our territory, our combat command aid territory. Mm -hmm. So we did that. We lost a sergeant there. Uh, we had to pile up to blow. And a rabbit or a rat or something tripped a, a wire that 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 exploded a mine that we hadn't gotten, we hadn't got, uh, found, and uh, he blew up the whole stack of of mines, teller mines that were I call them teller mines, bouncing beddies or whatever we gave them all sorts of names, and his <clears throat> sergeant Brancaglione, another Italian from Brooklyn, I guess. And um, even in Pete, that was the war was over then, and the Russians came in and we got out. Mm -hmm. Patton wasn't too happy about that, as you all know. He wanted to go to Berlin, but that would have been suicide. Mm -hmm. It couldn't have happened. It wouldn't have worked at all. Did you have any interaction with the Russians? Did you have any interaction? Interact, yeah. Watch us. <laughs> <laughs> We'd meet on the bridge. And um, or even we'd get across, or they could get across. But politically, we were supposed to be on out of Austria, and and uh, in Germany, we do what we damn well please. But um, no, they were crazy for watchers, and uh, a lot of them would say to they'd show you how many watchers they have, or anything mechanical. Um, remember, a lot of those are farm boys, and uh, way back, I mean. Uneducated, but they fought like tigers. Um, I sure as hell would like to have them on my side <clears throat> in any kind of a battle. But that's up to the powers to be to handle that situation. And uh, one job that was that was a real job, the bridge and the and the mines. But the next assignment, <laughs> believe this or not. The officers had taken over a recreation hotel for the German officers. You might as well cut this out later, but this is funny. <laughs> it was in the Eben Sea. But that, that was in Austria, though. How, how the hell did they get away with it? But it was close to the German border, anyway. and. Um, we had to repair it, uh, give the plumbing back and the electric back and so on and so forth. And then we had to guard it. <laughs> but um, that didn't last too long until General New General took over our division and he saw what was going on. He, he, he couldn't, I guess he could have um, do like Patton did, uh, fire him right away. He just chastised him. And, Yelled at them and put them to work somewhere they more where they could be used, mm. but they gave us a little rest though. That was our rest area for about two or three weeks, and then we got uh, a job of taking care of returning um, inmate, uh, returning uh, um, uh, inmates from. Misplaced person, that people that had to go back to Poland, to Yugoslavia, Italy, whatever, not Italy, but uh, uh, all these other countries that Germany had, uh, had, had overrun and made uh, misplaced, what did we had a word for them, persons, misplaced persons, no, something misplaced. like that. 
Displaced? Uh, Displaced? Yeah, something. Yeah. You know, we had to take, get trains uh, lined up and, um, and coordinate the return of these people to their, their um, uh, homeland. And one of my friends, yes, he, Boris Roger, a real Yugo saw. And they, he, he got on one tra train, to, uh, the car that went to Yugoslavia, and they tried to, tried to keep him. <coughs> we had to send the Marines in. No, we didn't send the Marines in. But we had, somebody got on the line and yelled at somebody. But they wanted, he spoke fluent yeah, Yugoslav, whatever, or Slavic language, and uh, they tried to keep him. But then nobody tried to keep me, but, but um, I didn't care about whether they kept me or not. I wanted to get home. Yeah. But uh, I did, on the way home, I got stuck. Now, the, my friend, the Boris Rose, uh, another friend, uh, Bush, of course, uh, uh, but Rose was uh, just a, a friend after the war. And uh, on the way home, we had to go through processing out as you processed in. And they were called cigarette camps, um, Chesterfield, whatever, Lucky Strike, and so on and so forth. And there, you were graded by the number of months overseas, how many medals you had, how many children you had. So Boris and I were at the bottom of the list. So we uh, had a lot of freedom while we were in the cigarette camp. And um, one night we got our hands on a couple of number 10 cans of tomatoes. We hadn't had a tomato of any kind, God knows how long. And we started gobbling tomatoes, juice and all. We shared them, of course. But we ate the most of them, two cans, number 10. Take it out. And, uh, the next morning I'm covered with hives. <laughs> now, that's okay. That sounds good. It sounds easy. You go to the, the, the medics, which I did. But I said, Boris, I have six pistols in my duffel bag. I, I, I don't think I ought to take him into the hospital. I put him in a separate bag, and when I come back, I give him to you now to hold him until I come back. Well, Boris and the pistols are in San Pedro, California, <laughs> because I was kept too long, because of I was uh, fair, I guess, of uh, everything about me. Uh, I had so many hives on me, I. I, I couldn't even, they had to cover me with powder. But you can eliminate all of this stuff. But, <laughs> but, uh, but no, I, I'm tempted to get a hold of Boris. He's still alive. I have my company roster. He you still know, has your pistols? No, he still got my pistols. He still got your pistols, yeah. Uh, but I, I got his address, but nobody can tell me on the other end. That, we don't have any Boris Rosa here, but the roster is old. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's 60 years old, and uh, I just started calling now, and they can't find them. But I had two German Lugers, 1918. I had a Walther, because we took Salem Mantis. I had a, um, I guess Salem Mantis made Walthers. 007, is not what he carries. Mm -hmm. I walked up, I have one of those. I had a little 25 caliber. I had a P38. That's what they gave it the name. It wasn't as classy as a Luger. That's a classy gun. Oh, beautiful, nine millimeter. Anyway, I had six of them. And I did send home a rifle, uh, which was okay. And I did liberate a typewriter or two, that's okay. 
I only took one poem. Um, I had all kinds of marks from the 20s, a million mark, a 2,000 mark. Remember, they went through all that, where they had to have a wheelbarrow just to get a loaf of bread. Mm -hmm. That's what made him so mad. That's what made him crazy. He had to get this. That, that, that's real. The marks, they uh, were deflated. And there was so much inflation that you would need a wheelbarrow to buy a loaf of bread. I was 1920s and so on and so forth, right after the war, their war. And that's what drove the idiot crazy, I guess. So, okay, no, I don't have... I should get it. You know, I can hear that, yeah. but I can't hear... Sounds! <laughs> Sounds, mother can't get that. She's, mother? She's got it. No, oh, about sounds versus voices. Yeah. I can get any kind of sound. But unless you're looking at me and not talking to the wall yeah. or talking, walking away, yeah. I don't care how expensive they are. I ain't going to work. Mr. Dippo, let me ask you another question about... Ask me questions, Jeff. I, I want to ask you another question about my thousand. <laughs> In, interactions that you had with the people that no, were there. That, I'm glad you brought that yeah. up. Okay. Even after they were deloused, uh, we were not allowed to have... Uh, um, Fraten, we weren't to fraternize. Uh, yours is a better term, but Patton loved that word fraternize. We were refused. We were ref we were told we could not fraternize with the Fraulein's. But you, you know that wasn't uh, that wasn't no. We just the hell with that. It's just, oh, well, too bad. Uh, but no, we knew why uh, we were. Uh, even after them in the house, we weren't. Uh, but they were shipped out almost as soon as, as they were deloused. And uh, I tell you the truth, I never saw those ladies that's in the other book I can't find. But there were women, obviously. And there was one of them that gave birth, like I said, that gave birth three weeks before we arrived at the, at the thing, at the camp. Um, donor, we don't know. I use the word donor. <laughs> we don't know. Uh, could have been pregnant before she was put in that nice country. Nobody brings that, that up at all. But th 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 that's a picture I showed you. The mother, old 90 some odd day, the daughter that was covered with sores and everything, and now her daughter. And then of course um, Tiber. There's a lot of good stuff. and. And there's a lot of authors, too, that uh, German ladies, especially, at the last hurrah, which was 2010, up at Louisville, where else? Port Knox. You know something that's strange, so? Where's his hat? I gotta cover up his ears. The armor, the school is no longer there at Port Knox. It's a Fort Benning. An infantry post. From the day one, it's been an infantry post. But it has the territory where it can work that way. That's become a non combat, combat, non combat troops doing paperwork and things like that. Like Bamsi is now, all paperwork people. And uh, every once in a while, I see a screaming eagle. And, uh, I'll say, oh, I didn't see you in Bastogne. Well, I wasn't there. I wasn't even born. Oh, did you go to Port Campbell? Yes. I said, I've been there. And we did. On the way home from Port Knox, back home again, my son-in-law driving the rig. I don't know if it was my rig that time or his rig. We took turns. He had diesel. I had uh, Gasoline. We had three motor homes that went through one of them 79,000 miles. And then the own, I got rid of after this stuff, only had less than 20,000 miles. I only got almost what I wanted for. But anyway, that wasn't where I was. I forgot where I was. Where was I? Well, I'd like for you to tell us a story about Tiber, if you would. About who? Tiber? About Tiber, yeah. Um, I wish I could read the. The citation. Um, one of the uh, lads that uh, I did 
not actually fraternize with him, but I was aware of his existence. We had kind of a like, draw the line in the sand, uh, animal thing. <clears throat> Let the medicos go in there, they could do it, only in, all the uh, uh, military government people could do What the hell they were doing, I don't know. But the medical people had to do it. Of course, they wore masks and they took shots too. So, but apparently, I was told, or he was, but he talked well. Uh, he started coming to our room. I wish I knew his last name. Reuben. Huh? Reuben. Oh, Reuben, that's his yeah. last name. Yeah. Oh, type of Reuben. Yeah. Okay. Well, I didn't know him too personally at the time he was an inmate at my house, or a prisoner, whatever you want to say. Um, but when I, I know his history, post uh, my house, <clears throat> he always wanted to be a G.I. Joe. And that was, he, it's his words. And uh, <clears throat> so, Somehow, being as young as he was, uh, he was able to get <coughs> sponsorship somehow into the States. So he came to the United States. Again, I'm not, don't know what age frame we are about now, but let's see. Uh, that was, would be 19, prior to 19, Korea War, 50 to 50. Three. Three. Okay. Uh, prior to 1950, he arrived at the United. He he found his way to, to the United States and made his wish come true. He joined the army and became a GI Joe. He was shipped to Korea. I an infantry unit. He was an infantry man. Uh, he um. I don't know the division he was in, but he was all the way up to the Yalo River, I think I'm aware of that. And this is where the Chinese were overpowering everything and everybody, that there's billions of Chinese. And um, anyway, he was left behind by his first sergeant, he and a couple other people, it's a man to Man the ground. They were right. They were on a hill, and they had a good um, view of the uh, approach. And so they were supposed to, like an Audie Murphy, they were supposed to take over uh, and protect their back while they, while they got out, while they retreated. <clears throat> so uh, the people, I think there was a corporal or a sergeant uh, in that group, uh, said, "This is stupid." <laughs> We can do our best, but we're going to boop, boop, and be, save our lives. So he was overrun by the Chinese and put in a Chinese camp in China, and uh, uh, along with his compadres. And uh, because of him having the past that he had and the way he had to scrabble for food, and to, and to steal and, 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 and do whatever he could to get food. He brought this to his prison camp, his ability to sneak out at night and, and gather a gleaner. He was out there picking up whatever that could be eaten. And more than that, he'd bring it back, he'd, 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 he'd make food for them, mix it with whatever he had there to keep his people, his converts, alive. And uh, and doing that, uh, prior to doing it, well, even while he was doing this, the Chinese didn't know, of course, or they would have shot him, but they did offer him his freedom because he was not an American citizen, but a, a Hungarian Jew. So they thought, of, I'm sure they wanted to use it for propaganda purposes, but he would not. He would not leave his comrades. And uh, it was because of him, as youngest man in the, in the group, 
Uh, because it couldn't have been much older than 16, 17, 20, 21 at least. Be, uh, that would be his age about at that time. Um, <clears throat> he kept their spirit up. He, he chastised them for, for moaning and groaning and giving up. And he made them uh, work and, uh, and eat and, and uh, pray and whatever to keep them going. And sure enough, I don't, I, the bunch that he was captured with were survived. And of course he was exchanged at Big Switch or Little Switch, I'm not sure which, in 53. Then when he gets to the States and, make, and makes a life for himself and um, marries, has his family, Oh, I don't know if he's married or has a family. I assume he's married. Um, but she never saw. Well, maybe she did, or some lady did. Anyway, he, um, he can cut this off. Um, he, um, he had lived. I forgot to say, oh, he did that. Korean War is over. Um, then somehow he found out about the 11th. He made some inquiries, probably on the computer computer or whatever about the 11th Armored Division, knowing he full, he knew full well that there was members of the 11th Armored Division that liberated him, him and his uh, companions at his Mauthausen concentration camp. So when he found out, then he made contact with our, with our unit organization and started coming even before he got these, his Congressional Medal of Honor. Oh, I jumped ahead. Anyway, he uh, started coming to our meetings when he could, uh, financially and otherwise. Uh, we took up collections for him uh, on many occasions because we wanted to see him. He's, uh, he's, a, he's a wonderful fellow and we like to see him. So, uh, and he likes to talk and so, we, that was okay, we had money in the, in the treasury. And then, um, and he had performed, uh, even during battle, uh, over and above, which was expected of a rifleman. And plus what he did for his, his uh, comrades in, 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 uh, in captivity. Uh, so somebody who was a member of that group that was a prisoner wrote probably to some congressman and told him all about Tyber's activities and what it did for his unit and for the men when they were captured. And it was brought to the chief of staff, I guess, chief, not, maybe not the chief, but some big monkey monk in the hierarchy at the Pentagon, and they discovered all this, what he did. He was put in for a Congressional Medal of Honor and was so honored with that Congressional Medal of Honor by President Bush, Jr. Mm -hmm. What year? I forgot. That was 2005. I I, yeah, yeah. 2005. Boy, I'm glad you can edit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to go back. We were at the World War II was ended. You said you were anxious to get back to the United States. When did you get back home? Oh, oh! After I lost all my pistol. Yeah. After my highs went away. Yeah. Well, I'm laying in bed one day in the hospital, and boom, boom! I do I do her? Oh, not boom, boom, boom! Are you who is Dippo in there? Yeah, he's in here. Um. And it was my scoutmaster from my days when I was a scout. In fact, uh, he saved my life, kind of, I guess, before. Can I digress to 1939? Sure, sure. Because this reminded me of my scout days. So in 1939, I'd be 14, and uh, we went down to the World's Fair. We saved up money and so on and so forth. We had bake offs and cook whatever and we got enough money to hire a bus and the whole troop troop 21 and uh, that's right 
I was, I had no merit practice. <laughs> I just, I got that mixed up with something else while we were talking about the door. No, I was just a Boy Scout. And uh, uh, I'm Troop 21 from Troy, New York. And so we got down there and we got, uh, he was able to get us into the, um, World's Fair? No, well, yeah. we got it. Yeah. The, uh, the place where we lived. Dormitory or hotel or? They have them for women, they have them for men. Dormitory? Dor oh, no, well, anyway, no, I should know what it was called. Mother? What? Never mind. Um, so, something to do with youth. Hostel? Huh? You like hostel? it, like it, hostel, but yeah. it's not. Okay. Okay. We got, we got in Wisconsin, this nice place in, um, in in Brooklyn or somewhere, and uh, somehow I got in a room I didn't want, and there's a about a three foot ledge outside my window. Goes around the corner to the room I wanted to be in with the people I wanted to be with. And he caught me as I was stepped out on the ledge. I would have walked around, I wouldn't have been that big. At 14, what do you know? You're not, you're not, no, you can put this out somewhere. But that's what, we got to the World's Fair and I had my mother's box camera with a broken lens and I shot three perfect rolls. And in those days, they gave you an eight by 10 of your choice when you had it developed. I got the changing of the guard and God knows what the other two were. But um, yes, that was one of my soldiers I forgot about. Being a Boy Scout almost got me in trouble. It did get me in trouble. One morning, early in my Training at company in Company A, First Platoon. This first sergeant called the company to attention and yelled out this command I never heard before. Just right, right. And I went like this. He meant like this. This is called close interval. Just right, right. And then he walked towards me. I didn't know. I'm looking this way. Everybody else is like that, uh, whatever, on the other side. And I'm like this. He's walking straight at me. He, he didn't yell like they do in the movies or anything like that. But he got my face and said, Private, what are you doing? Oh, you said, dress like dress. What do you think that is? I'm a Boy Scout. Oh, <laughs> there's a shovel and, <laughs> and there's some dirt. Go to work. I said, what did I do? Did I say close interval, dress like dress? No, you said dress like dress. Well, you're doing what we call in the Army, close interval, dress like dress. Oh, shit. That was my beginning with my first sergeant. <laughs> I knew everything, you know that. I'm a cocky SOB. And oh, no. I'm driving <clears throat> with a neighbor who's eight years older than I am. And this is maybe, see, I had 10 of my years were enlisted. I went from Sergeant Major to Major in 10 years. Think about that. It's not usually done in 10 years. <clears throat> but I had this time behind me. He didn't go we drive him somewhere, some guy said something. Uh, he, sp he came into the Army as a second lieutenant. And 
It took him 22 years, still a major when he retired. I just say that not to be a thing, but to, to what I say next. He told to me one day, he said, you know, Dippo, you're an arrogant son of a bitch. I said, you know, I know that. But look where I got in such a short time. I shouldn't have said that. But uh, I'm proud of what I did. I was able to do it. And the best thing about being a second lieutenant, once you've been a sergeant major, is that they can't pull the wool over your eyes. Of course, you had to carry a clipboard and a pen for a while. But these sergeants, the old sergeants, uh, try to do I said, don't try it. You look at this, Buster. Don't look at this. You had to stand there until I come back. Hey. Then I realized that I had power, and if I knew what to do with it, it'd take care of me. Mm -hmm. And it did. Because they called me from the career branch. We got home and remember that's less almost less than ten years. I made it in sixty-two, fifty-three to sixty-two. That's nine and something years. From second lieutenant to major. And then <clears throat> I I that was already but then a year and a half in grade, I'm sent back from t Germany with this gang. And assigned to Fifth Army, Fourth Army, then not Fifth. It was Fourth Army <clears throat> at Fort Sam. I, I remember this is '63. And that was June. When I got back. Five kids, the youngest being that one that was here. The oldest is now '63, and about the same age. It was nine months. Don't worry about it. They're all the same. Shit, her family were counting. Don't put that on there. I wasn't doing no, the math. No. Do, but don't do the nothing there. So, where was I? You were talking about in 63 when you got out of the oh, military. Oh, 63 uh, in June. And you want me to tell them, tell them. Uh, no, you're warm. Take your shirt off. <laughs> I don't care. I've been there before. Remember, I was in the commune shower, and we didn't have gays. I don't remember hearing that word even. Yeah. Out of 150 men. What was it? Oh, at 63, came back in June. Five kids. Okay, I got quarters on post, brick quarters, the good ones. I don't know how I did that, but somebody was looking after me. I had brick quarters, <clears throat> five kids, and uh, I'm home having lunch because I can walk then from the quadrangle to my quarters. And um, I get a call. And, uh, I, I never answered the phone. I never answered the ashtray. I had a wax. Uh, uh, if they're going to put them in the army, Work them. I didn't want, I don't like female workers or, or anybody in the uniform female. So I gave them jobs. One was to make sure I didn't lose my cigarette lighter and make sure my ashtray was empty. So anyway, I come back, I'm, of course, you can call me what you will, but, um, but I'm not that way anymore. And uh, because they're doing a job they shouldn't be doing in the first place out there where they are. Terrible. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Major Dippo, this is uh, uh, the Pentagon wants to talk to you. I said, I'll talk to him. No, he wants you. Okay. Yo. Yo. Vietnam. You mean French Indochina? No, I mean Vietnam. Some kid. No. I didn't. I didn't harass him after that. Because he didn't know, I said, "Fine, give me my. Uh, tell me, you got your record, my record, in front of you? Yes. Turn the pages. How much time have I got? Twenty-two years, two months, two days. I have an idea. You're going to retire. I am. Thank you. Boop. 
So I didn't go to Vietnam because I had enough time to retire. I don't feel bad, but I always, when I see a Vietnam hat, <clears throat> which I see quite a few, commissary here and there and everywhere, I get to them before they get to me, and I shake their hand. I said, I said, but for 22 years they're alive. And they had to explain it, I guess, well, I do a couple of times. But yes, he said, you're an arrogant son of a bitch. <laughs> so I, I'm trying to, I was, I'm not going to deny it. But I knew, if you're, only, if you're going to be one of them, you better know what the head they're talking about. They do it this way. We don't know. That way is the way you're stuck. Now do it. And you better be right. But to this day, the poor fella can't hear any better than I can. And he's still alive. He's eight years older. You can know that is. 86 plus eight. Wow. He's only crashed up one plane. <laughs> Maybe that could have been one reason. <laughs> and, it, and his job was flying the hump, Burma, uh, to bring the uh, stuff into the Flying Tigers. Oh, and I knew Tex Hill. He was from the Flying Tiger, and I had him as a customer, had been in his home, and uh, he died, that poor, he's a lot older. He was a National Guardsman, went in, became regular, went back to the National Guard, made Brigadier General, and then died. Because they got me at the airport one day, going somewhere, and. Uh, Oh, I love to show them my badges about here, the implants and shit. I said, no, you can't touch me. Don't you dare touch me. Hey, Mr. Hill, uh, uh -huh. you don't touch me. And the guy looked, no, you can't touch him. <laughs> I have fun in the airports. Uh, but I believe in it. I wouldn't mind being screened. I can care less. <clears throat> Where was I? Oh, so. We were going to Vegas, I think. No, we were going to uh, say uh, uh, San Diego to catch a boat to Hawaii. We took a 15 day to Hawaii. And uh, where was it? You were taking your cruise to Hawaii. Yeah, but why? Where did I come up? I don't know. No way we do. What you do? You're gonna tell me a story about somebody that you knew or you met? Well, there is a story about yeah. that cruise. Oh well, you know we won the won the prize. That's took, right. Yeah. You took you the mic off the. You showed me the, the newlywed game. You won the newlywed game. Yeah. Yeah, of course. We simple. We knew the answers, obviously. Which did you ever have with a hooker or whatever? It was easy. I do all the answers. I think we missed two, and uh, that's not why I was where I was headed. Ah, damn it! I forgot. It must have been a good story, but uh, I forgot it. <laughs> well, I've got one more question I sure. want to ask you. Um, what has it been like for you to know that you participated? We talked about Mathausen, and that's one of the focuses of this interview. What, what has it been like for you to know that you helped liberate it makes and me free up. those people from... It makes me puff up like a rooster. I feel so proud that we could do that. So proud when I see Tiber or when I see the ladies that come sell their books, uh, anything. I, it makes me so proud that we had a chance not to shoot Germans all the time. Uh, I always tell them, I'm so thin, I used to walk sideways, and they couldn't hit me. <laughs> well, it's not true, but, uh, but no, I never, so whatever. And, and Bush, he should have a medal. A lot of things that, uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm puffed up about a lot of things I know, all of uh, people and things they have done and accomplished, but, but I'm puffed up on myself that I was able to do something. I couldn't hug or kiss, but I, I could do something. I could get watch those German citizens and, and, and growl at them. 
or keep open, anything to tease them for being, and, uh, telling me they don't, uh, telling the world they don't know what was going on here. And, uh, you know that's a lie. But uh, after talking to you guys now, I'm going to try to get a hold of the kids that want to know about their uncle. Yeah. Walking. I was just far away from them. I saw them both go. But they should they know better. Because they're going to fire on you when they know where you are. And they knew where we were, obviously. They knew, you know what it is. Look how much intelligence we have. We know where people are. Now, before we had all that stuff up there, we know where you are. People call us on the phone even, there was a phone system. The 11th Armament is over there, so on and so forth. They knew where we were. But um, <clears throat> getting back to that, I mean that sincerely. Um, I wouldn't be afraid to touch, a, to touch a body out in the snow to help if he was still alive. If the MP, you can't get a medic every time you need one. And we knew enough, oh, I got to admit, my canteen wasn't full of water. And I was hoping their canteen might, because they're supposed to take those pills that are in the packet. And I'd have the packet open, and, and, and then I realized I don't have the proper liquid. Well, I could have, I guess, it would have been something. Uh, it's anti uh, to, to fight the disease or, or infection, and so on and so forth. But um, I, um, in my arrogance, um, I, it's not going to happen to me. I won't need it. I'd rather drink what's in the, what's in the thing. But even our water tanks, our water, uh, what's it called, sir, well, one of them was anyway, in my hat truck. <laughs> uh, it was. I was so young that I guess it was funny, but it really wasn't. But uh, it didn't get me down, and uh, it's been uh, <clears throat> what I could do in the military. Uh, I took that to the civilian life. In fact, here's how I got with Sears. We got home. I mean, I retired on May the 31st. 1964, with the five kids in a small place. The girls were, the boys were stacked. And the girls, little one was only 18 months or 20 months, so you in a crib. And the other two were um, in a queen size bed, I guess. Yeah, there was a queen. And the crib was over on the side. What was it? No, oh, I'm about yeah, retiring now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's not for real. That's for real. I, I get off with a tangent. And um, uh, which one was it? One of them got a sore throat. Um, and we took her to uh, Bamsey. There was no Bamsey then. There was wooden frame buildings and so. Okay, keep her, keep her uh, separated from the rest of the kids. Your children. I said, fine. So, I went down to Sears, medication was taken care of, she was being taken care of medically, <gasps> excuse me, and uh, I went to, but she was, had to stay there, and uh, she didn't want radio, she wanted television, so I went down to buy a television, I'd seen advertising, excuse me, and uh, a black and white I think even, yeah, I guess it was. Of course, there was color then too, but I think this was black and white. Just to put the room, and personal, personal, personal. I stood for ten minutes, waiting for somebody to come to me. And there's this guy sitting over there on top of a television, this kind. They were big and consoles, smoking a cigarette with his tie askew, like we wear them now. And that's, it wasn't then. That was supposed to be tied. 
smoking a cigarette. Okay, I waited to say a word. I'm not hiding, I'm there. He's in conversation with somebody, I don't know, not a customer, an employee. <clears throat> Got on the elevator, went upstairs. I figured the office would be upstairs. I said, where's the manager's office? Office, I want to speak to him. Very important, urgent. Well, he's not here, but the superintendent is. I said, fine, let me see the superintendent. He said, Major Dupont. <laughs> I use my right for I never do, but I did that. Um, I'd like to speak to him. I think it's very important. And uh, what the hell was his name now? I made a joke of it. Something to rhyme with something. Anyway, I got to see him, and I told him what I thought of his people and why they treat, why were doing they allowed such. Such uh, insubordination, like, as I'm sure you've given them rules to live by, to represent Sears. And we talk, and we talk some more. And then he comes up with this line Could you do any better? I said, with my hands tied behind my back. But I don't need a job right now. I've got pay some uh, stocked up for a month. I said, call me when you got room, call me up. Check it out. Never begging, <laughs> being cocky and arrogant, as it were. Well, about two weeks later, I get a call. Mr. Tippo, could you come and see, see us? <laughs> oh, I stayed with them 22 years. <laughs> and every time somebody had a complaint upstairs, the girls would say, you, not I, Mr. Dippo. No, no, it must have been somebody else, ma'am. No, it was that tall blonde. No, but then not him. He wouldn't do that or say that. But uh, I didn't take any shit from Cosmo. <laughs> Why should I? <laughs> but uh, anyway, I stayed with him 22 years. I had my own department. And I'll tell you one thing there's somebody more crafty than me. He was a warrant officer retired, and I don't know what his job was or whatever. And this when we carried rifle weapons. Sears had uh, rifles. We didn't have pistols. We had rifles, rifles and ammunition. And um, so he sold a rifle and ammunition to somebody. And about three weeks later, some lady comes into the customer service wants to return the rifle. And she said, go downstairs to the to the um, uh, sporting goods department. What the hell is his name? I forgot his Jim. I didn't like him anyway. Jim something. Uh, he wasn't my type. Um, uh, but he was in this instance. <laughs> but he didn't say it. That's the point. He came down and he said, well, what's wrong? I watched it. But, uh, it's good, it looks good, it's been fired once. What, do you want your money back? Why? Well, he shot himself with it. And uh, he started to say, well, he, he did what he wanted. Why should I take it back? He didn't say it, though. But that was on the tip of his lips. So I think I might have stepped over, but because he was a bitch, yelling and screaming about it. Him shot himself with your gun, <laughs> and then it, he wanted to say what it did his job. <laughs> what else you got for me? <laughs> well, that's you've been real generous with your time, so <laughs> I, I got more time than well, money. Uh, David and Robert and I want to thank you for your service to thank the country. You, thank, thank you, thank you, and for thank your you. service, and and also being generous with your time this afternoon. Tell mother to cook. <laughs> we will, we will. <laughs>